Good morning, and welcome to Living Word Bible Church, at least sort of. Whether you are a regular with us or whether this is your first time interacting with our church, we are glad you're here and welcome this morning. I'd like to start off by asking you a question. When is the last time you played hide and seek? Maybe you're remembering all the way back to your childhood. Maybe it was something you did recently with your kids or grandkids. But while I have you thinking about that, I have another question for you. What is or what was your favorite hiding place? I'd like to tell you a story. When we lived in Maryland, one of our children's adopted grandparents, Miss Betsy, was visiting one afternoon and the kids talked her into playing hide and seek. Apparently they had done this before when she was watching them and it was one of their favorite games to play with her. After a couple of rounds of playing, Betsy came down the hallway to talk to Rochelle and said, did you know that your bathtub is full of water? Rochelle thought that was kind of an odd question to ask. So she said, no, why? Betsy pointed down at her pant legs and showed that they were wet. She explained that she and the kids were playing hide and seek and that she had gone to hide in her favorite spot in our bathtub in the hall bathroom. Only this time there was water in it. She had won the round, no one had found her, but she had gotten pretty wet in the process. I'd like you to invite you to turn this morning to Psalm 91, grab a Bible, look it up online, I'd like you to look at Psalm 91 together with me, and we're going to read this psalm and then study it together for the next half hour or so. I'd like to ask you, in light of the pandemic in our world around us, in light of the disruption that all of us are facing in our lives, what is your favorite hiding place? And by that, I mean, where do you go when you're afraid? Where do you look for comfort? Where do you look for protection? Where do you look for guidance. We're going to answer that question from the Bible. Where can I hide from the dangers around me? We're going to find out what a spiritual hiding place is, what the best hiding place for us is in times of trouble. We're going to look at what the text says. We're going to discuss what it means and then how it applies to us today. We're going to go through a verse at a time but I'll start by reading for us Psalm 91. You follow along, please, in your copy of the scriptures. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look, and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we rejoice that we can come to you that you allow us to call you Father, that you make us your children through the shed blood of Jesus. Lord, as we look around us, there is disease, there is suffering throughout our area, throughout our nation, throughout our world. And we look to you, the sovereign God, the creator God, 
to protect your children, to work your perfect will here on earth as it is done in heaven. Please help us when we are afraid to trust in you. Please give us good reminders or perhaps for some new understanding this morning of who you are and the ways in which you protect your children. Our Father, we pray that you would help us to focus our thoughts right now, that you would unite us around your word to fear your name and to glorify you by listening with our ears and with our hearts to what you have for us today. I pray that you would help me to teach your word accurately, to share it in a way that we can understand and that we can change through your help to be more like you as a result of this time together. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you who have been on our Facebook page, there is a handout there, and later when we post this on Sermon Audio, I'll attach a PDF there as well. So if that helps you follow along, we're going to start by looking at the theme of Psalm 91. Here are some different descriptions I found as I was looking at study Bibles and commentaries. This psalm describes the confidence that the believer may have through all manner of dangers and challenges. Another one. In this poem, strong assurance of security is offered to any who will take shelter in God based upon the poet's personal experience. And one more, this psalm is a beautiful testimony about the security of life. And that's what this psalm is. It's a poem. That's what this book of 150 psalms in the middle of the Bible is. It's a hymn book. It's a song book. And it's poetry. In this case, it's a testimony of someone who has known and who has seen that God is our source of security. He is our protector. And so an outline that we can use today, the first 13 verses show us the Lord's protection. That's the first point, the Lord's protection, verses 1 through 13. And then we'll look at those last verses. The last three verses, verses 14 through 16, represent the Lord's promise. So number one, the Lord's protection, and then later we'll get to number two, the Lord's promise. As we look at the psalm, I believe you will find a blessing if you look closely at the pronouns. That may seem odd. This isn't a grammar lesson. But if you'll look at the pronouns, the personal pronouns, they will tell us who is speaking and to whom. For example, verse 1 is written in the third person. It says, he who dwells. He, third person. But immediately in verse 2, it switches. That's written in the first person. The psalmist, the writer, says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. And then it immediately shifts again. Verses 3 through 13 are in second person addressed to the reader. Surely he, that means God, shall deliver you. And we'll keep seeing references to you, 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 giving instruction, giving encouragement. And then we get to the last few verses. Verses 14 through 16 are first person again, but it's not the writer, it's God speaking. There we read, because he, that means the righteous one, has set his love upon me, God says, therefore I will deliver him. So pay attention to who's speaking, and the pronouns will help guide in that process. Right now we're going to start with our first point, the Lord's protection. Go with me back to verse 1, please, where we read these two verses. And I'll warn you up front, we're going to spend a while on the first two verses. We won't cover all of them in as much detail as we're going to cover these first two verses, because they are the key that unlocks this psalm. Verse 1 says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. This opening two verses sets the tone for the psalm. It, it in many ways gives us the theme for this psalm, that he is our security, those who will trust in him. Now notice there are four names here for God in the first two verses. We have Most High, the Almighty, the Lord, and my God. Let's look at those individually. 
Most high is the first one we have. Most high, the Hebrew is El Elyon. And what it emphasizes is God's strength, his sovereignty. The fact that he is ruling and reigning over everything and everyone. Someone said that he is the all-sufficient one who is adequate for every situation. And he's also almighty. We have that as El Shaddai. You may have heard that name of God before. So he is all sufficient. He's adequate. He's up to the challenge. He's up to the task. Shaddai is from a name, a word that means mountain. And that shows as if God is up on a mountain. He's towering over. He's above everyone and everything. And then we have a familiar name for those of us who are students of the scriptures, and that's Lord. It's Yahweh. It's the covenant name for God. It's the one who keeps his promises to his people. He's faithful. And then the last one is God. It's Elohim. It's where we, the one we first see at the beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. That's Elohim. He is the creator God. And his greatness and glory surpass anything that we can imagine. So there are four names for God here at the beginning. But then in addition to that, I'd like you to see that there are four terms of security in these first two verses. There are four terms of security, shelter or secret place, shadow, refuge, and fortress. We read about the secret place of the Most High. Someone said this is an intimate place of divine protection. Some of your translations, depending on what you're looking at, may say shelter. And do you know what that means? Whether you have secret place or whether you have shelter, do you know what it means? It means hiding place. It means refuge. Psalm 32, 7 says, You, Lord, are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. The shadow of the Almighty. Think about who this was written to. This is a land... The, the Near East area, the land of Israel is what it became. And he's writing to people who understood how hot the sun was and that shade is a blessing. We talked about that a little bit in our psalm last week, Psalm 121. That shadow was a metaphor for care, for protection, for comfort. And then we have refuge. That means a shelter from danger. Psalm 46, one might be the most famous verse from the Psalms about a refuge. There it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And then the last one is fortress. That represents strong protection. He is our protector. There are also two verbs in these two verses. We read about dwell and abide. To dwell, it means to live. Literally, it means to sit down, to remain, to settle. To abide can be translated to rest. Literally, it was to stop overnight, as if you're on a journey and you're going to settle in for the night. In modern terms, that would be you're going into a hotel to spend the night. So if I could share with you a different, a modern translation, more of a paraphrase of Psalm 91, verse 1. It says, live under the protection of God Most High and stay in the shadow of God all powerful. So this is it. This is our spiritual hiding place. Our security, our protection come from hiding in God, from abiding in him. In fact, abiding is how it's described. If you want to look this up on your own, John chapter 15, Jesus talks about abiding in him and what happens. That's the idea, abiding, staying with, dwelling with. And another phrase in the New Testament that represents this idea is in Christ. You'll read that over and over as you read the book of Ephesians, especially the first three chapters. So being in Christ, dwelling with him, abiding in him, living with him. And then we have this bold statement that says, in him, I will trust. This is total reliance on God. Someone called it the ideal of biblical faith. Why? Because this psalm, the one writing this psalm under the influence of the Holy Spirit, is 
sharing his testimony and sharing what God is to him, what God has done for him so that others can feel confident in this God. What's the bottom line? That God is trustworthy. And that's where the rubber meets the road. If we will not put our trust in God, or if we think that we cannot put our trust in God, then all is lost. Please turn off your phone, turn off your computer, don't watch any more of this, there is no point if you don't believe that God can be trusted. Will you trust in God? If not, then you're going to be panicking like everyone else in the world around us right now. From those first two key verses, we're going to move now to verses 3 through 8 that list some benefits of those who trust in the Lord. Here's some of the ones that I wrote down. You can take your own notes if you want to, but we see deliverance in verse 3. There are several in verse 4. He's our covering, a refuge, a shield, a buckler. And then verses 5 through 8, I would describe as protection. So these are some of the benefits for those who trust in the Lord. Deliverance, covering, refuge, shield, buckler, protection. Maybe you're like me, and you delight in the fact that God is these things for us. Maybe you would begin a prayer, or you would spend a time praising God and saying, Lord, thank you that you are my refuge. Thank you that you are my strong tower. That's great. Please don't stop doing that. But have you ever stopped to think about what that means to be a refuge and a strong tower? What would prompt anybody to need a refuge or a strong tower? Trouble, danger. There's a reason that we need protection. We are running to God because there is something wrong in the world around us. Have you ever stopped to thank God for being your refuge and your strong tower when everything's hunky-dory in your life? You have no trials, no struggles, everything's great. Our tendency, my tendency anyway, is not to think about God quite so much. Okay, I've got this. Okay, life is good. But God has a way of redirecting us, of reminding us that we need him, doesn't he? When things are going well, I'm tempted to think that I don't need God. So sometimes he sends us reminders that we need him. He can send COVID-19. He can send other trials into our life to get our attention and to drive us back to him. Look at verse 3. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. What's a fowler? A fowler is someone who traps birds. And here it represents plots against the believer, people who are after you to trap you, to harm you. And then we have perilous pestilence. And frankly, that's what drew me to this psalm this week. It's a psalm I've read before, and I received verse 2 at the end of an email from the school I went to, and I started reading it. And twice in these few verses, we read about a pestilence. What is that? Perilous means deadly, something that's going to kill you. A pestilence, here's the definition I found, dreaded diseases, plagues, and epidemics. Do you think that fits our world right now? What does it say? Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Verse 4, he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Cover you with his feathers, under his wings. Are we saying that God is a chicken? No, we are not. But that's a picture. It's a metaphor to help us understand. Just as a bird, a parent bird, will protect its young by sitting on that nest, by putting them under the feathers. It's a picture of the protection that we have. It's repeated in Psalm 57.1 that says, Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. For my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. I will find my refuge in the shadow of your wings. Combining shadow from the earlier verse now with wings and feathers here. 
Second part of verse 4 says, His truth shall be your shield and buckler. What does this verse say that our defense is? Where will we find our defense? Yes, in God, but specifically where? This verse says that the defense in our spiritual warfare is the word of God itself. That is our protection. That is our defense. When you're fearful right now, when you're experiencing doubt, where are you going? Where do you look? Our shield, our buckler is in the word of God, but are we looking at your favorite news broadcast or your favorite social media or friends or coworkers? Where are you looking when you're surrounded by fear, when you're surrounded by hardship? What are you doing to protect yourself? I would encourage you to dive into this book, dive into the word of God. Read this and other Psalms. Think about those. Think about who God is. Think about the one who is in control of all of these things. We'll take verses 5 through 7 together because we're going to read there, as one person said, in God we are secure at all times, in all dangers, in all circumstances. In other words, all the time, everywhere, we are secure in God. Look at those verses. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the error that arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence, there it is again, that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall come, it shall not come near you. When we read these verses, this section especially sounds kind of like battle, and maybe the psalmist had a battle or a war in mind. We don't know for sure. Some of this isn't specific, and that actually helps us because it applies through so many other times and circumstances to know God is my security. He is my shelter. He is my shield against the pestilence, against the arrow that flies by day, the destruction that lays waste at noonday. There may be thousands dying around you, but he says it will not come near you. One commentator wrote that we live in a culture of fear where people are worried about everything from flu epidemics to identity theft to terrorist attacks. And when I read that, I, I had to look at the copyright date of that commentary to see how long ago it was. It was about 2008. People around us are worried about everything from flu epidemics, identity theft, terrorist attacks. Here the psalmist exults not only in the saving power, but the keeping power of God. Does this mean that believers will be immune from danger? No. But it does mean that regardless of the physical, emotional, or financial battles surrounding us, the Lord himself is our refuge. Therefore, what else do we need? I can't rip verse 7 out of context and say, doesn't matter how many people die of the coronavirus around me, it's not going to touch me. I know of at least one believer a few believers that we've heard of that have caught this virus. It's not saying that no trouble will come into your life or that this virus or this other sickness won't affect you. What it's saying is that God will protect you. Verse 8 explains that further. Only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward, or other translations have punishment or recompense of the wicked. What are we talking about? Specifically, the judgment that's coming to those who don't place faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. Those who will receive eternal judgment. This psalm isn't a prosperity gospel that love Jesus and everything's going to be fine forever, amen. Well, everything will be fine forever, amen, but there will be hardship and trials while we're here in this life. But what does it say there? Only with your eyes you shall look. The idea is that we will be spectators. It will not affect us when ultimate judgment comes. Why? Verse 9 says, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Verse 9 almost starts over the way the first two verses did, talking about God being your refuge. And the psalmist interjects again and says, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague 
come near your dwelling. We will be safe. Reading about the plagues reminds us and probably reminded them of the plagues that God sent on Egypt during the time of the Exodus under Moses. And as you read those passages, those chapters, you'll read about the early plagues seem to have affected the Hebrews, the people who became the nation of Israel. But later, God was very specific, and he did not allow, particularly think of the last plague, the death of the firstborn, did not allow that to affect his people if, by faith, they followed his direction and painted blood on the doorpost so that he would pass over them. What are we saying? God's ultimate judgment on wickedness will not affect, will not come near those who have put their trust in him. Verse 11 expands on that. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. One of the tasks given to angels is to serve believers, to minister to saints. It's good to note that even in times of stress, even in times of difficulty, God has promised to protect us sometimes through angels, that he'll send them to do his bidding. Now, for some of you, those verses may sound familiar. And the reason is that Satan quoted part of verses 11 and 12 when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. You can read more about that in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus, of course, responded with Deuteronomy 6. He quoted scripture accurately and completely back to Satan. But what are we saying there? Warren Wiersbe said that if the Father had commanded Jesus to jump from the temple pinnacle, the top of the temple, if he had commanded him to jump down, then yes, the angels would have cared for Jesus. But to jump without the Father's command would have been presumption, not faith, and that would be tempting the Father. What are we saying? The fact that God is protecting you doesn't give you permission to go be foolish. He will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. What ways? Anything I want to do? No. The ways that are according to God's plan, according to God's will as we follow him. What's even more interesting is that Satan didn't quote all of verses 11 and 12. He kind of edited them for his own purposes. But then he skipped verse 13 entirely. Check out verse 13. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Well, again, we have a metaphor for what would harm us, what would endanger our lives. But which animals in particular are chosen here? Look at them. Lion, cobra, young lion, serpent. Hmm. All of those are biblical illustrations, descriptions, symbols for Satan. So what are we saying? Ultimately, it will be Satan who is trampled by God. He promised that in Genesis 3.15. Now we've finished with the first section here, the Lord's protection, and we're going to move into the Lord's promise. What has he promised to do for his people who trust in him? Again, the speaker for this section is God himself. And he's describing the blessings that he's going to give to those who trust in him. Look at verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. The word love here is not the typical word that you read in the Bible for love. It's actually a word that means deep longing for God or clinging to God. If you think of a young child, if there's something scary that happens, a, a thunderclap or something else that catches the child off guard, maybe it's a bad dream, wakes up from that, what is that child going to do? It's going to run. He or she's going to run to a parent and maybe hug that leg or bury her face. Why? That's the innate response. That's the automatic response of a fearful child to run to mommy or daddy. That's the word for love. Because this righteous one has set his love upon me, is clinging to me, is trusting in me completely, running to me for help. Therefore, I will deliver him. Pay attention to all these I will statements. I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. 
I would refer you back to those first two verses where we were studying four names of God. He knows my name. Verse 15, he shall call upon me. In other words, pray, and I will answer him. He will hear our prayers. I will be with him. He will be present with us in trouble. I will deliver him. I will honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The original language for long life is literally for length of days. And that same phrase is translated in Psalm 23, 6 as forever. So we could substitute forever here. Forever, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. When we read that word salvation, particularly in the Old Testament, think in terms of both physical salvation and spiritual salvation, both. Someone wrote, this psalm closes by laying out what the ideal of trust looks like. And by that, their phrases, holds fast to me in love, knows my name, calls to God in times of trouble, and repeating God's pledge to care for his faithful ones. Look at them again. Deliver, protect, answer, be with him in trouble, rescue, honor. Such a person will have a long life, likely meaning eternal life, and will enjoy God's salvation. How are those for benefits and promises for those who trust in God in times of trouble? Those who abide, who dwell in the secret place with the Lord will have protection now and salvation forever. So I ask you this morning, have you come to him for salvation? What does that even mean? It means that I recognize that I've sinned against God. I've broken his rules, his laws. Doesn't matter how many, doesn't matter whether I think they're good or bad. I've broken his laws. And because of that, what I deserve is the death penalty. But Jesus, the son of God, took my penalty. He took the death penalty for me. He exchanged his life for mine so that I could have eternal life with him. Salvation is a free gift. There's nothing I can do to earn it. So then how do I get it? The answer is by believing that Jesus is the only Savior. By trusting him to do what I can't do myself. He's done it for me already. And so I cry out to him. I call on him. I pray to him is what we call that. And I let him know, God, I can't rescue myself. I can't save myself from sin. Will you do it for me? We call out to him in faith, in belief, asking for salvation. And you can do that today. And if you do, he will save you. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. What about those of us who are already abiding in Christ? If you can trust him with eternity, then can't you trust him with the present? If you can trust him to save you from sin, can't you trust him to save you from a virus or some other trial around you? He can keep you safe from harm. He will. He's promised in this psalm and other places to do that. Now, I can't and don't promise you that you won't get sick from this virus or something else. I can't make that promise. But I can trust promise that if you trust in God, if you hide in the best hiding place of all, in God himself, if you go to and depend on him to protect your life, your health, your family, your eternal, eternal security, he will. And he invites you to come to him. We have all of this in God, our refuge our hiding place. Are you hiding in him? Would you pray with me? Our Father, you are so much and more. We recognize that you are the God who created all things. You are the God who makes and keeps promises to your people. You are the God who is high and lifted up and greater than any God, because you are the only true God. 
And Lord, we rejoice today to know that this God, who is all of those things, has stooped down to make himself available to me. We thank you that we can come to you through Jesus Christ, through his shed blood, through his sacrifice for us. We rejoice in the eternal life that we have because of his resurrection from the grave. Lord, I pray for anyone who has not yet come to you for salvation, that this would be the day that your Holy Spirit would guide that one, that he or she would have faith to believe that you are the only way. And Lord, for those of us who have trusted you for salvation, may we trust you with each trial. May we run to you May we trust you. Lord, we trust you. We've proven you over and over again, and yet we pray for grace to trust you more today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If any of you would like to join us, check out the link on our Facebook page. We're going to have a discussion. If you have any questions or you have any prayer requests you'd like to offer, join us on Zoom in just a few minutes. Before we go, I'd like to share this blessing with you from 2 Corinthians. Blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God bless you.